Good evening and welcome to If These Walls Can Talk, Showcase and Next Steps. This program is brought to you by the College of Charleston Alumni Association with the support from its generous annual sponsors. Thank you for joining us. I'm Dr. Sharissa Owens, Director of Diversity Education Training in the Office of Institutional Diversity at the College of Charleston. It is my honor to moderate a discussion among distinguished faculty and alumni panelists, including Dr. Anthony Green, Director of African American Studies at the college, Dr. Shannon Eves, Assistant Professor of African American History at the college, and Olivia Williams, Class of 2015, who also received her MA in History last month from the college. She is a history interpreter at McLeod Plantation in Charleston. We are delighted you could join us as we discuss the craftsmanship, artistry, and labor of enslaved Africans who were tasked with building the 13th oldest college in the nation. We also share some artifacts and information about programs and curriculum at the college. So in the film, If These Walls Can Talk, we bring forth evidence of our ancestors who actually built this college. The main attraction of the film is a brick. In that brick, you guys can see the excavated fingers prints of enslaved individuals who actually built the college. This particular brick is actually what started the conversation of not only creating a film, but also the actions of how to embrace our history and how to support and elevate African-American students, faculty, and staff. This particular artifact is not the only artifact. This artifact is an example of what is seen throughout our city. It is important because it has a great deal of stories told that we often overlook because of our his history when it comes to telling these kinds of stories. So I'm gonna go ahead and ask our panelists a quick question to get us started this afternoon. Dr. Eves, why is this artifact significant for a predominantly white historic college? Uh, well, thank you so much for having me here. It's a pleasure to be with all of you all to have this conversation. I think that an artifact like the brick that we just saw uh, is, is so important, particularly for a predominantly and historically white institution, because it reminds us that we cannot separate our country's legacy of slavery from any institution that exists here, that the labor of enslaved Africans is in fact foundational to the founding of our nation and the founding of our oldest institutions like the College of Charleston, as you mentioned, being the 13th oldest uh, college in the nation. And in that way, slavery, the experiences of enslaved people is not just African-American history, but it is American history. Right. It is the College of Charleston's history. Right. And if we want to finally have a full conversation, a conversation um, that can bring about reconciliation, repair, restoration, if we want to be able to have a conversation where we can facilitate a, an open and welcoming environment, one that breeds diversity at our college, mm -hmm. uh, then you know, we, we have to acknowledge this history. We have to have conversations about this history. Mm -hmm. And so I think that you know, for many people, it does take something tangible like a brick. Right. To, uh, to, to really help them wrap their, their minds. And, 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 and so this brick, I think, is important because it can help us facilitate 
those, you know, those very important and I would even argue well overdue yeah, I conversations. Agree. I agree. And those conversations are rooted in the stories, right? Because without the stories of what our ancestors left behind, we don't get a full picture of our American history. Mm -hmm. And somebody who speaks to those stories on a daily basis would be Miss Olivia Williams. Um, Olivia, I would love to hear your, um, your thoughts on why the brick is significant for a predominantly white historic college. Definitely, and thank you, Dr. Owens, for having me on this panel. Um, so working at a historic site where we do center the enslaved narratives, um, having that brick be found at the institution that I graduated from twice um, really speaks to why I do this work because there aren't a lot of institutions, um, whether it be cultural, historical, or colleges that are speaking to this really difficult history. Um, and so to know that this conversation is being had is really important to the work I'm doing because we tell all of our stories with the legacy and history of slavery in mind. And we actually have a brick here with three children's fingerprints in them. And those were from enslaved children and um, enslaved children were commonly used to hand make bricks on plantations. And so I think it just further aids in the story and it is an uncomfortable history. I mean, that's why my sweater said history should make you uncomfortable because yes, it's uncomfortable and it's difficult, but it's important to know that slavery um, didn't just, and doesn't still just impact plantations, whether it be rural or urban, but it impacts colleges and cities and buildings and the College of Charleston being a predominantly white institution, um, unfortunately, the histories that surround slavery and African American history don't get talked about or told enough. And I think with the finding of this brick, with that tangible evidence, makes it possible to not deny it anymore, to bring that conversation to the forefront. And I'm just happy to work at an institution that can supplement that with facts, with artifacts, with evidence um, of our own as well. Absolutely. I, as you were speaking, you know, what is difficult is the fact that this story, these, these, the, this part of our history has not been a part of the College of Charleston's history as it should be. It has not been um, a part of what we even learn in school, whether it's K through 12 or higher education. I think the fact that we came across this, the fact that our institution has backed the film and these conversations, and we're gonna discuss a little bit later some of the actions are steps that is going to propel the College of Charleston to be a leader in this space. And I'm gonna tell you why. There's two reasons, I have a great deal of faith. One is because of where we are. The College of Charleston, regionally lo this regional location primes us to take that position. No other institution should be a leader in this space except for us. Two, it is literally on our grounds. It is literally being unearthed, whether it's a brick or a slave badge. Recently, this past spring, we've actually had some students uh, participate in uh, their coursework, and part of their coursework includes um, doing uh, archaeological digs. And in one of their opportunities to do so, they came across an actual servant's badge or a slave badge. This slave badge speaks to the presence of enslaved individuals at the College of Charleston in the land that we are in, um, that we occupy at the College of Charleston. It actually outlines the city, which you can see vaguely, but it's still there. You see Charleston, you see uh, the year 1853, and the slave badge or the servant badge will also indicate the, the person's job or position. That was to protect that individual as they went about the city in different spaces. And this is just what we've come across haphazardly. Imagine what we can do as an institution if we are intentionally bringing this forward. I'm gonna go ahead and ask the same question to both Dr. Eves and Olivia. 
we have that brick. It was found near the campus. So we understand that it's definitely part of the city of Charleston. But the significance of finding that badge on the College of Charleston campus, why is that so um, impactful uh, in your work, Dr. Eves? I, I think it's I think it's so impactful. Again, I'll, I'll reference something that you said a second ago, Dr. Owens, about the the city of Charleston and its significance and the College of Charleston's place within that. You know, the College of Charleston is is um, you know, like you said, should be at the forefront of telling stories about slavery and enslavement because there is no city that was more significant to the importation of the forcible importation of Africans into this country than the city of Charleston. You know, more enslaved people came through the ports in this city than any other city in what would become the United States of America. And so finding this slave badge on our campus shows that the College of Charleston is not separate mm -hmm. from the larger city of Charleston, mm -hmm. but it is in fact of the city of Charleston. Mm -hmm. And so the same way that the importation of Africans was taking place here in the city of Charleston, um, the same way that the, the forcible labor of enslaved people was happening in the city of Charleston, the same way that the exploitation of Africans was happening here, that means that it was also happening on the College of Charleston's campus. Right. If it were not for the enterprise that was African slavery, the College of Charleston would not exist. Right. The earliest benefactors who donated money to create the endowment that would start the College of Charleston, many of them did so through either um, either money that they derived from the sale of enslaved people or whether it was by um, leaving, you know, requesting that their enslaved people be sold in their wills right. and then that money be donated to establish the college. So that's how many of the, the, those original donors um, were, that was the pathway right. that they were giving their money to um, so again, the College of Charleston as an idea right. was quite literally built on the value mm -hmm. of enslaved people as property, and and so again, even our founding presidents, many of them were slaveholders. Mm -hmm. So they, you know, they they had enslaved people who were working on this campus, right. um, students were being served by enslaved people mm -hmm. on this campus. As we know, enslaved people built um, you know, buildings, they lived. We have evidence mm -hmm. of slave quarters that exist on our campus that people walk by every single day and probably aren't even aware right. that, that, that that's the landscape um, that they're navigating. Right. And so I think that, you know, again, having this tangible object uh, shows us that we can't think about slavery as separate from the College of Charleston. Slavery existed on this campus. Right. Enslaved people lived, labored, were exploited, likely experienced violence, right. humiliation, um, but I'm sure they also established networks right. and supported one another right. and created you know, kinship relationships. And so they lived for the fact that there are slave quarters here. This, this, is, a, this is a space where they slept. Right. This is a space where they made family. This is a space where they loved one another. Mm -hmm. And so in that way, they are a part of College of Charleston history. Well said. I think um, what's really powerful about these tangible artifacts uh, and just as you mentioned, Dr. Eves, is that it brings a story that has been dehumanized to a space of being human, where we're seeing families, we're seeing children. Um, that still kind of chokes me up a bit. I mean, I've seen it 
I've read a little bit about it, but ha having two children of my own and knowing that literally my children's fingerprints could fit in that excavated brick um, really chokes me up for quite a bit. But it's bringing the humanness to the stories that have not been there before. And I think what makes me so excited is that our college now has this great opportunity and that we are all a part of it to be more responsible in telling this. I think we are primed as far as not just our location, but also timing and where we are as scholars, as graduate, recent graduates and as staff members to literally be socially responsible in telling these human stories. We're trying to help, what's the word I'm looking for? Help our audience or those who are seeing this understand that this is not about politics as much as it is about a human story that has been marginalized because it's been so uncomfortable to talk about, because of the ugliness that's attached to it, because of the violence that has been attached to it. And anybody who understands family, anybody who really understands generational um, challenges understands that you cannot keep secrets that has challenged a family and not grow. This has been our secret that has challenged us. But I can tell you in the time that I've been in the position I'm in, the fact that we've had these conversations, I've seen us grow as an institution. I really have. And this has just been in the short three years I've been in this position as the Director of Diversity Education and Training. While we may not be growing at the rate that we think we should, we're still growing. And I appreciate the growth. I appreciate the growth. And speaking to that growth, it's really, really important to understand what that growth looks like. Right? It can manifest in so many different ways. On our campus right now, we're doing a, as much as we can with the resources that we have. But one of the things that's actually standing out is the fact that we not only are um, embracing our history, we're working on different initiatives to tell a fuller story of our history, but we're at the same time, we're supporting African-American students through a program, a scholarship program called the 1967 Legacy Program. This program is set up just to support students, African-American students, who not only want to come to the College of Charleston, but also have a strong interest in learning about their African and African-American history, their heritage. And for many of the students who are um, selected to be scholars, this is what attracted them to the college. The fact that you have a predominantly white historic institution openly talking about these conversations, openly supporting the research being done so that this work does not stop, right? And this is done well before George Floyd. This was in the works almost about two years prior to, right? George Floyd and everything that corralled around that just accelerated a bit, right? Mm -hmm. So as we're talking about some of that growth, we're talking about the scholarships for those 10, now 11, um, 1967 legacy scholars, we also want to open up opportunities for our campus members to become more educated about our institution ties to slavery. And how do we do that? Well, we're definitely, we're setting things up right now for our race, equity, and inclusion curriculum. So I'm gonna go ahead and ask uh, Dr. Green, could you give us an overview of what that curriculum looks like and where we are? Absolutely, um, and, and thank you for, for everyone. Um, again, my colleagues, um, Dr. Eves, Dr. Owens, and Ms. Olivia Williams, um, African-American studies major graduate. She's a part of the first class in 2015. Um, so she's very familiar with um, the growth that you spoke of regarding the curriculum. And so um, I'll speak to both um, REI and if you don't mind, REI as it is a part of the growth of African-American studies. Right. Uh, African-American studies as a discipline dates back to the mid-1960s. Um, on the College of Charleston, it was not established until, I believe, 1994, and it was a minor. And under, under the guidance of um, the late uh, Dr. Consuela Francis, um, she was able to you know, push forward and, and ruffle some feathers. And it finally 
um, got on board with um, offering African American Studies as a major in 2015. Um, and again, Olivia Williams, I mean, excuse me, fall of 2014 was the first semester that uh, students could actually um, sign up as a major in African American Studies. And since that time, we've, we've grown in terms of um, course offerings. Um, but to, to the point of you, the point you made about um, progress, yes, there has been progress, but it has been at, at a snail's pace regarding African American Studies. Right, um, but some of the initiatives that you mentioned that, that we are a part of, that we're engaged with, um, the race equity and inclusion um, requirement, and, and real briefly, is a requirement that has been, um, you know, approved to uh, where students would have to take six six credits um, in order to graduate when it's firmly um, and finally implemented. Um, three credits have to be U.S. Three credits have to be uh, focused on global. And in that, the focus is, is, is on how colonialism, white supremacy, and racism are all intertwined across the curriculum. Mm -hmm. To Dr. Eve's point, when you think about the history of this college and how um, enslavement is, is a part of the fabric of this institution, so the idea of white supremacy and racial ideology is very much built into the curriculum, right? right? And so what we have, I believe um, Dr. Owens, you mentioned earlier, that the, the, the discussions and the lectures and the readings about um, enslavement or people of African descent has literally been excluded um, in K through 12 education and in many regards, even, even, even in higher education until recently. Um, but again, that, that is still very minimal in terms of the requirements. Students are not required to take an African-American history course. Students are not required to take a Latin American uh, Caribbean course. They're not required to take a women and gender studies course. So the narrative of American history, the narrative of the American experience is still very much uh, white centered. And so race and equity and inclusion has been created for the purposes of you know, many, many regards filling that gap. So it, it is the idea that students can take a course, whether it be, it doesn't have to be an African-American studies, it could be an English course, mm -hmm. where the focus of the curriculum, the focus of the content is going to be intersected with race, it's going to be intersected with gender. It's going to be intersected with uh, social class. It's going to be intersected with um, global analysis of business, whatever it may be. And so we're hoping that um, as we move forward as an institution, this becomes very much a part of um, you know, the, the, the experiences of all our students, not just our students of color. And I have to bring up to the point that um, this initiative is student driven. This does not come from um, for, the, for the most part, did not come from faculty members. It did not come from administrators. It came from students, students who literally said, I'm sick and tired of having a curriculum and content that just either glosses over or completely ignores the contributions and achievements of people of color and other marginalized groups. And in fact, the first initiative began um, back in 2013, I believe, and it essentially sat on the shelf. And so again, students kind of mobilized around the idea of what's been going on. Again, this predates George Floyd. We could talk about the incidents that happened specifically on our campus. We could talk about the racial incidents that's happened nationally. And how all of that compiled these ideas of our students, white, black, Latino, gay, lesbian, all came together and said, something needs to change regarding what we are actually being taught in the classroom and how we can utilize and understand the experiences of these marginalized groups as we move forward once we cross the system. So the race equity and inclusion requirement is, is, is in hoping to do that very thing. To Again, it's not to erase or eliminate some aspects of American history. It is actually to be more inclusive of what not only American history is, but how other people, people of color and other marginalized groups have contributed to that history and how they're continuing to contribute to what's going on in contemporary America. Absolutely, and I think we often, um, we don't give enough credit to the fact that what we teach has gaps, what we teach has holes. And there, there are holes that are set up intentionally, things that are glossed over intentionally, and think things that are not done so intentionally. And I think what we're trying to do with REI, Race, Equity, Inclusion Curriculum, is to fill in those gaps because it tells a fuller story. Um, Dr. Green mentioned that it's, this is a process of where we are. It's very much student driven. Our students are crying out for this work um, because they understand, probably better than us, um, I'm going to just say um, of, of older generations, <laughs> you guys 
that generation, our, our students that are coming through the college right now, they have a better sense of how globally connected they are, right? You know, through social media and through their means of communication, they understand how this is not just a South Carolina education. This education that they're going to get from the College of Charleston is going to set them up for the global market. And to be better prepared for that, you have to be more open and knowledgeable about a full history, a full present, and a full future of what learning can look like, of what their discipline can look like. And so this is going to be a process. Um, so what Dr. Green spoke to a little bit earlier is what that REI curriculum can look like. Dr. Green, um, could you kind of give me an overview or give us an overview of where we are at in the process and where we need, where we want to be um, when it comes to implementing the REI curriculum? Yes, yes. So um, my colleague and I, um, um, Dr. Morgan Corner of German Studies, we're both um, the, the um, um, co-chairs of the REI curriculum. And so over the, over the course of the last year, well, yeah, really over the course of the last year, but it has picked up steam this past spring and currently this summer, where we've spoken to deans, we've spoken to um, department and chairs, and we've spoken to um, program directors about the ways in which um, they could, you know, coordinate a course, meaning they can actually create a course that, are, that is REI designated, or they can try to re reinterpret some of their, for example, their inter entry, entry level courses, like the introduction course in the sociology, for example, and how they can change, again, some of the content, change some of the readings, change some of the assignments, um, and how that would look to meet the REI requirements. So we've done that over the last year or so. And so right now, Morgan is, um, is collecting those syllabi. And so what we're, what we're tasked with doing is collecting syllabi across the campus from, again, hopefully every single department and every single program where we're, we will um, do a curriculum upload of those um, um, courses. And right now, I believe we have, uh, for, the, for the US side, we may have anywhere between 60 and 75 courses that are currently on the books that are currently taught consistently on campus that would meet the REI requirements. Mm -hmm. And I think we have 30 to maybe 40 um, global classes, classes that will meet the global content of REI. And so once those things are implemented and uploaded in, in the curriculum, that means that when students go to look into their um, degree works, right. right, they will find uh, the, the um, REI de designation in their degree works. And you, if you register for a course, it would be a little check mark. Um, right, and so, but again, before that we get to that stage, it has to be presented once again to the faculty senate um, in September, October's meeting to get a vote. And again, we have to present, okay, here are the courses, here are um, the number of courses and here how it, it covers the REI, but also here are the programs and the departments who are literally creating um, um, new courses to fit the REI. Then it'll go up for a vote and if approved, Fall 23 will be the first wave of incoming freshmen that will have to take um, over the course of their four year experiences at the College of Charleston. Um, they would have to meet the REI requirements of, of three credits in the US, three credits um, in, in global. But to supplement that, we are hoping to both program over the next academic year. Um, African American Studies is leading that charge to um, offer up um, lectures and talks and panels bringing in scholars across the country who are doing some of this type of work where they're showing how you can quote unquote decolonize your curriculum. And, and, and again, one of, our, one of our own colleagues here at the College of Charleston in, in English, Simon Lewis, Dr. Simon Lewis, he retweaked his in English 110 class. And so he didn't change the type of assignments that was given. He didn't change um, the number of assignments that were given. What he did change was actually have all of his students read and, and discuss African-American authors as opposed to primarily white authors. Mm -hmm. And that was just an example of how you can kind of change your curriculum. You're, given, you're meeting the same criteria that's been had down by English, um, the number of, uh, number of assignments, the core, core assignments, the, you know, the assessments and all of those things. He just changed 
the content of what they would read or who they would read and, and, and the writings that were put forth. And so we're showing, hopefully over the next academic year, we bring in scholars who show examples of that in philosophy, who show examples of that in the in business curriculum, who show examples of that in um, biology, you know, astronomy, you name it. And hopefully we're able to put on a workshop um, next summer for um, interested faculty members who, again, who, who are very supportive of REI, but may not have the, the intellectual background of, of how to implement um, content and readings in their course, but they're on board and want to su be supportive of REI, therefore they want to create a course. So we, have, we, got, we hope to have a three to five day workshop next summer where faculty members can sign up and we'll bring it in, hopefully we'll bring in consultants who go over that information about, for example, decolonizing mathematics. And this is how you can you know, change certain um, types of content within the discipline of math um, to show how race is interconnected with math content. And so once again, hopefully, I keep saying hopefully because those things are not necessarily implemented just yet. Mm -hmm. um, so this is where we are and this is where we hope to move the college um, forward. Um, again, we're seeing these same type of initiatives and efforts being um, put forth at other universities. Mm -hmm. And so this is kind of what we've modeled ourselves after. And again, hopefully by fall 23, we'll have the, the first wave of incoming freshmen who will have to take uh, REI, race, equity, and inclusion requirement in order to graduate. The first of its kind at the College of Charleston. And I must once again reiterate, this has been student driven. Right. Students were calling for this. Right. right. And, there's, um, and there's another point, um, Dr. Green, that I'd like to reiterate. Number one, I, I just want to thank, you know, as a colleague, just want to thank you for the work that you've done to to raise this issue, to keep raising this issue. As you said, this has been something that has been on the table for a long time. Mm -hmm. And and I think it's important for our, um, our alumni audience, especially to know that this is not a revolutionary concept, no. that universities across the country have had curriculum requirements like this for in some instances decades right. and so the time is now because of all the things that we've talked about up to this point in this conversation mm -hmm. that the college of charleston not only join the you know not only join the pack mm -hmm. um, but you know get itself on track to being a leader right. in 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 these sorts of initiatives yeah. And so, you know, I am very hopeful and um, that uh, the work of Dr. Green and others will um, finally come to, for, to fruition yeah. because it, it, it is so, so long overdue and so necessary. And, and as he said, it, it's, it's student driven. And if, we, and if we are in fact really and truly committed right. to, you know, attracting a diverse student body. And I think that, you know, almost every study <laughs> shows mm -hmm. that diver diversity amongst your student body, diversity amongst your faculty and staff, and, and, I, and diversity can be looked at in lots of different ways, yeah. but it, it, it only makes for a richer learning environment. It really does. And I, I, I agree, I, I uh, co-sign with what Dr. E just spoke about, Dr. Green. I know this work is tireless. It's, it's not, uh, it should have been done yesterday, like I believe one of the students said in the film, like yesterday. Um, <laughs> the fact that we stick with it is why we do what we do. You know, our, our ancestors dealt with horrific circumstances, but they never gave up. And I think that still runs true to us as faculty, as staff members, and even as students when it doesn't happen, when it, we want it to happen, but we still persevere through, we are honoring the same strength and resilience that is very much present in our ancestors' voices, whether it's the imprint of fingerprints in a brick or the reminder that they were here once upon a time because of the slave badges, right? It's also a part of growing as an institution. While the REI curriculum is set for our students to learn, there's still a bit of a learning curve for our faculty members 
to learn about this, right? It's helping our faculty members, our staff members to learn that what they learned, what they are even teaching is still very much limited, right? And while we are all very gifted and talented and um, well-informed in our different disciplines, when it comes to these kinds of connections to our discipline, specifically sciences or mathematics or um, business, we have to recognize that there are parts of our disciplines intentionally left out. There are parts of our discipline that is not being discussed or is not embedded because systematically it was set up to leave marginalized communities out. We as a College of Charleston have the social responsibility to fill that back in and help our faculty members, help our staff members who may not see it because for them it's invisible, right? For them it's invisible. Dr. Green, I see your hand, go for it. Yeah. Um, to that point, to, your, to both of your points here, um, again, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna keep reiterating and pushing this, this agenda of how this is student led, right? So what you're finding, uh, as you're saying, as Dr. Ease mentioned, um, to have a richer um, collegiate experience, you have to, you know, I don't care where you are, it could be the College of Charleston, it could be James Madison, it could be George Mason, it doesn't matter. To have that rich collegiate experience, you need a, a, a richer, diverse um, student body, you need a richer, diverse um, faculty and staff, so forth and so on. But to that very point, our students, both Black, white, and otherwise, um, who may not be African American studies or women and gender studies or Latin, Latin, Latin uh, Caribbean American studies majors or minors, but they are, you know, biology majors who want to be go into medicine. They are, um, you know, school of ed majors because they want to be a teacher or they're business majors because they want to be an entrepreneur. They tend to kind of creep into the African American studies, the women and gender studies and the Lat Latino American studies courses. And once we, we broach the conversation of the interconnectedness of the history of med medical racism and black folk and how that relates to their major in biology, they're now going back to their biology courses and asking the much needed questions. Well, why aren't we talking about this? Absolutely. Right? This is very much a part of the, not only the history of black folk, but let's talk about the history of MUSC. I want to go to MUSC to major in anesthesiology, but I just learned in Dr. Green's class, or I just learned in Dr. Eve's class, that MUSC has a legacy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of experimentation on enslaved people. Right. Let's talk about that in my biology class. Right. And so professors, as you mentioned, um, Dr. Owens, professors need to be able to address not only those concerns, but address the content to make that learning experience for their students to be more holistic Absolutely. because you can't, you can't, this, what we're doing is a disservice to our students, particularly when they're asking for it. But at a certain point in time, and I believe we're at that moment, students are going to start demanding that this be taught in their courses, even REI or not. They're going into their classes. Why? Because they just left Dr. E's class at 11 o'clock and they're going to their biology class at 12 o'clock and say, look, this is what I just learned that I've never been taught before. Right. I'm trying to figure out how does this relate and intersect with biology in my biology class? Because I want to be a doctor. Right. Black women and mortality rates in terms of childbirth right. and child rearing. Why aren't we talking about that in my biology 300 class? Right. Students are going to be the agents of this change. They were the agents of change in the 1960s. That's why we got black studies. That's why we got women and gender studies. They're going to continue to be the agents of change in the new millennium. So, whether or not we want to be on board as an institution or as individual faculty, it's going to happen. Right. Either you jump on board or you get left behind. Right. And hopefully, um, I see you, Olivia, I got you. I think our college is moving into that space. We are now moving into the space of not just um, creating pathways so that can happen. I think we are also in a space of trying to do it responsibly. And if anybody understands how processes work or even how um, higher education can often work, sometimes if you go to, uh, if you react to it, it can create a whole new set of problems, right? And we don't want a whole nother set of problems. We want to be the ones that are doing it and doing it well enough to be a model. Uh, so I have always advocated just a little bit of time 
so that those individuals who are actually working on this can do this without bias playing into it, without um, uh, being clouded in their thinking, but being more responsible and having different voices and different um, perspectives part of the change moving forward. Our institution is very diverse, but it can definitely improve in that area as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass the torch on to Ms. Olivia Williams. Um, go ahead and share what you wanted to share and uh, we'll be kind of begin to wrap it up after your comments. So I just wanna to speak to um, kind of what everyone has said, just from a student's perspective, um, especially with the diversity aspect of it and just how Dr. Green was speaking to more disciplines need to talk about this because of course, you know, I was an undergrad a few years ago, but it was even more limited then um, because Dr. Green's class would get full so quickly. So if you didn't get into his class that semester, then it was like, oh, you just missed out. There really weren't many other opportunities. And I didn't have the fortune of having Dr. Eves. Um, she wasn't there when I was an undergrad, but at that point it was actually Dr. Powers and his classes would also get full very quickly. And so it's like, if you didn't get one of their Dr. Green or Dr. Powers class, you pretty much missed out on any kind of black studies, black history. And so that's why I think it's very important to reiterate what Dr. Green was saying about it not just being on the shoulders now of Dr. Green and the academic studies department and then Dr. Eves being the only black history professor at the College of Charleston. Um, I think it's important that other people, like they said, get on board, but also coming from the School of the Humanities, I think more money needs to get funneled in to the School of the Humanities and Social Sciences because you said they found the slave badge on campus. Well, just imagine how much more could be done if more money's being funneled into the anthropology department or the archeology span department or the history department or the academic studies department um, because that's what, people are training to do in those departments. Um, we've had people from the Historic Preservation Department come out to McLeod and help us discover stuff about our history. Um, people who haven't even graduated yet. So not only is it gonna help tie in the history at the college, but that's giving them hands-on training for their future jobs as well. To be able to say, oh, I excavated and look what we found, these artifacts that help tell the history of the college. And so, I think that's also a really great start. Start giving money to the people who are the students who are actually doing the work. Like, like Dr. Green said, these are students. When I was at the college, um, I remember when there were protests every day on campus because of who they chose as the new president of the college. And it, it, people were very outspoken. They weren't afraid to say, you know, this is not right. This is what should change. And I'm very happy to hear that that has not changed since I left. And I think that funnels into the graduate school as well. I think money should be given, resources should be given to the history department, the public history department, um, and any other type of science, social science and humanities, because we're the ones who are leading the charge. We're the ones, you know, like I work at McLeod. And if it wasn't for my history degree and public history master's, I wouldn't be prepared to be here and I wouldn't be prepared to tell these very important stories about enslaved people, enslaved narratives, fingerprints and bricks. Um, so I, you know, I'm very grateful for my education, but like Dr. Eves and you, Dr. Owens and Dr. Green said, more could be done. There's a lot more, um, especially with these new generations of students who are coming in. They want to see people who look like them whether it be black people or uh, Latin people or Asian or whoever, like I said, Dr. Eves is the only black history professor at the college. <laughs> like that's, you know, that's just unacceptable. There needs to be, cause all of it can't fall on Dr. Eves. Um, but you know, from what I've heard, at least she's doing a great, great job. So <laughs> you just shout out to you, Dr. Eves. Like everyone is so excited about you teaching your African American history course. But in same with Dr. Green, you know, back in, and this is the last thing I'll say, back in undergrad, you know, he, he was the class to have, like, as soon as registration opened, it was like a bunch of clothes to write down the Oaks page because they all, he was talking about things that other people weren't talking about. Black images in the media, 
Um, we took a class on like race relations, on Af intro to African American studies, you know, all these classes that no one else was willing to tackle. Dr. Green was like, yeah, we're going to talk about this. <laughs> and Absolutely. I think that there needs to be more of that. Absolutely. And from I, a student's perspective. Yes, <laughs> it, it, and it should be. And it, I think we're moving in that direction. No, I don't think. I have confidence that we are. We are calling on our allies, our white brothers or sisters, our Asian, our African, our allies to take hold, to help shoulder this work. It should not just be on the responsibilities of the faculty and staff of color to do this. If you're uncomfortable learning about this, that's kind of where you need to be to break down some of the biases and uh, misinformed um, ideas and information that has been taken on. Our allies need to step up, right, at the College of Charleston, whether it's our staff members, our administrators, our, our, our um, faculty members, and even our own students. This is where we look for the allyship to come to fruition, right? And I say all of that because we are right around the corner from a very important day in our history that many people don't really know about, which is Juneteenth. Um, and what's really important about Juneteenth, of course, if you don't know, is that it is the day that um, enslaved individuals were, were informed of their emancipation, not necessarily the date. <laughs> they were informed, and so we celebrate that as the Black Independence Day. And in Texas, it kind of went from there. I, I would honestly say that the fact that many people don't know about that, we don't give it the celebration that we should, is part of why these initiatives are warranted. You know, with the 1967 Legacy Program, the students need to know if they don't already know about Juneteenth. When it comes to REI, they need to make those connections as to why we celebrate the, the, the sacrifice of our ancestors, as well as all the many achievements that has come through those bloodlines and is still present today on our campus. So when it comes to the walls, if these walls can talk, the documentary, I understand it is extremely uncomfortable as a person of color, black person who is not originally born and raised in Charleston, South Carolina, I constantly feel that I am just um, uh, an outsider looking in, but there is a part of me that is still very much a part of that community because of those ties that we share in relationships as far as our ancestors go. When this moves forward, I think our students are screaming that we continue to move forward, if not accelerate this process, right? Our faculty members, particularly African-American faculty members, are screaming for more leverage, more support, so that they won't be the only ones shouldering the responsibility of this. Our institution needs more to bolster the work of our existing, stu uh, existing students and staff and faculty of color by helping support our allies, our faculty, staff, and students who are white, who are Asian, who may not necessarily be tied to the community that we're speaking of right now. Um, so as I wrap this on up, I'm going to do a quick round robin. Is there anything, Dr. Eze, you would like to share before we close out? I, I, I would just like to say that I think that um, the power in this documentary is that uh, because, you know, we, you know, I, I know this story, I, you know, I, as, a as a slavery scholar, um, you know, Olivia, you know this story, you know, this is the work that you do every day. Uh, but this documentary is important because it can open up the eyes of not only members of the Charleston community, but also it, it can be an invitation to our alumni and the people who care deeply about the College of Charleston. Right. And it can um, provide them with an opportunity to, uh, because they also have a very powerful voice. You know, and so when we think about, when we think about allyship, you know, I, you know, I want us to also focus on members of our, of our larger Charleston community, as well as the extended College of Charleston family. 
Um, and so, you know, for alumni who are, who are going to see this, if, you know, these are the stories that you, uh, that you want to see told, and if this is, if, if, if moving the college in this direction, if this resonates with you, you know, show your, you know, show your, show your support, let your voice also be heard. Yeah. Um, so yes. that would be my closing. Those Absolutely. Are my closing thoughts. I love that. Thank you, Dr. Ease. Dr. Green, closing remarks. Um, nothing more than uh, just a thank you for uh, this platform and uh, creating the space to have these conversations, particularly um, targeting our alumni. Uh, I would like to think that many of our alumni, uh, particularly predating my time here, may not be aware of the implementation and the growth of, of African-American studies and other things that are going on with, with the college. Um, but also we'll just kind of reiterate the point of uh, the significance of our, our allies across campus. The work, of, the work that's being done, the work that has been done, um, can't continue to rest, as you said, on the shoulders of black and brown faculty members, black and brown students. Um, that is another, you know, both psychological and emotional burden that you know you have to endure. We do the work because the work needs to be done. But in order for systemic and institutional change to occur, we need the powers that be to be on board with not just um, you know vocal support, but actual implementing um, policy. And to, to uh, Ms. Williams' point about funding, uh, that's a, that's a good place to start. Um, most, if not all, of the initiatives that we've discussed moving forward, initiatives that will come about organically in the next couple of years, would not have much institutional impact unless it's supported not only by the administration, but it's supported by funding dollars. You want more black students at the College of Charleston? You have to put money behind that. You want more black faculty members at the College of Charleston? You have to put money behind that. Otherwise, we'll be dancing in the same circle, having the same conversation two, three, four years down, down the road. Thank you. Absolutely. I agree with everything that you said, Dr. Green. And uh, again, we are taking steps. We just need to continue and make sure those mm -hmm. steps that we are taking are sustainable. Absolutely. Um, and more importantly, help, our, help support our allies to do this work. It cannot be, and I keep saying it cannot be on our shoulders. It cannot be on our shoulders. Ms. Olivia, closing remarks, my friend. I just want to strongly agree with Dr. Eves um, about how impactful this documentary is going to be because doing what I do, I meet people from all over the world, all over the country. And it's always really interesting to me to see how little people actually know about the history of slavery and its legacies. And I think that it's going to start a conversation that some people may know nothing about, may know a little about, but I meet people every day who are like, wow, I had no idea. And I just think that th even this conversation we're having is going to be really impactful and just bring a lot of light to the College of Charleston's history that has been otherwise dimmed. Um, and I'm just really happy to be a part of it because this is what I do every day. I love telling this difficult and underrepresented history. Um, especially as it relates to women and children, because I think that Black women's history is often um, diminished, if told at all. And um, same goes for enslaved children as well. And so I'm just very thankful you asked me to be a part of this, um, especially alongside two incredible scholars like Dr. Eves and Dr. Green. Um, so that's all I got. <laughs> just thank you so much. Well. Thank you so much, Dr. Green, Dr. Eves, and Ms. Williams. We can't thank you enough for sharing your incredible insights with our audience today. We look forward to continuing this discussion. On behalf of the College of Charleston and its more than 97,000 alumni, thank you for joining us. Have a wonderful afternoon, morning, or evening.